All right. All right. Can everyone see my screen? It should be a slide. Yep. I see yeah. it. Cool. OK. Um, all right. I'll just uh, get started a little bit early. Um, so uh, thanks for coming, everyone. I'm just going to be talking about mobile development with Azure for beginners because I'm a beginner. <laughs> So that will be, it'll be from my perspective. Um, so yeah, just a quick intro. Hi, uh, my name's Eugen. Um, I am from Northern Virginia. So I grew up here, went to elementary school, middle school, high school here. And then I actually went upstate New York uh, for college at Cornell. And then after I graduated, um, I actually decided I missed Northern Virginia and I missed uh, being home. So I came back and I took a job at Microsoft working on the Azure government engineering team as a program manager. So I did that for about a year. Uh, I gave a lot of presentations actually, which was great. I really like um, presenting. Uh, but then I realized after a year, I'm like, ah, I really miss coding. And I realized uh, coding is my true passion. So I went back to um, being a software engineer. Uh, and then, so I was doing that for about a year and then I changed companies to LinkedIn um, it's technically the same company, but it, it's, it's kind of like, it's pretty much a different company. Um, so yeah, I, and I work in the ad space and I actually am based out of New York. Uh, the office is in the Empire State Building. Um, but I think I probably won't go back to New York. After all this stuff happened, I realized I probably, probably like the suburbs more. Um, but yeah, that's just a quick intro about me. So I wanted to go over the background and motivation um, for this little side project. So I was came from a place with no previous mobile development experience. Um, and at school, they don't really teach you mobile development. And um, usually in the corporate setting, unless you're hired as a mobile engineer, you usually just do web application and web development. So um, I was coming from that perspective. And you know, obviously, I use my phone a lot. Everyone uses their phone a lot. Um, and so I thought, oh, it's probably good to at least try uh, learning. And so um, I decided to take on the side project. And um, uh, interesting thing is during quarantine, um, I started to bake a lot with my sister because uh, that's all you really could do is just eat. So um, we would be baking and there'd be a lot of uh, issues because she would be using her laptop to display like the recipes and um, it would always get sticky. There'd, it'll, there'd be like flour on the keyboard. Uh, and so I was like, huh, probably would be better to just have like a mobile app to uh, look at when you're baking because you, when you're baking, you're moving around a lot. You're moving around the kitchen. So um, you can just carry around your phone and um, be a lot easier. So that's kind of the motivation for, I built this little CRUD app, uh, like a recipe app. And then lastly, I wanted to take advantage of the cloud. Um, just because I'm a huge believer in the future of the cloud. And also I thought um, it would be cool to just like integrate, um, you know, the stuff that I knew about the cloud with like a mobile application. And I wanted to see how well like um, the cloud was equipped to handle that. So, uh, and just a disclaimer, um, this, that, like I said before, this demo will be more focused on the backend components. Um, I'll have, I do have one slide on React Native, uh, but I don't go too in depth into React Native. So um, that's kind of what this demo will be more focused on. Cool. So uh, just a really quick intro into the tech stack. It's pretty, pretty simple, nothing fancy. Um, the API is just a Java Spring Boot application. Uh, Spring Boot, for those of you who aren't familiar, is just an open source Java framework that allows you to create uh, just standalone app. It comes with a lot of out of the box capabilities for managing like rest endpoints, auto configuration for dependencies. So um, it's really easy to work with. And then for the front end, I built a React Native application, uh, which is actually just basically JavaScript. So um, React Native, and I'm gonna go kind of into a little bit more depth later, but it's just an open source mobile framework, just a JavaScript library basically, <laughs> that renders to whichever native platform UI you want. So that's great because you can literally just have one code base and use that to package up an app for Android or iOS. Uh, so that's why I chose it. Cause I was like, I don't really want to just learn, you know, go really deep into Swift or like play around with the Android studio and um, have it only work for uh, one platform because my family actually use both. So that was why I chose React Native. And that's why a lot of people choose uh, React Native. 
And then um, Expo is a framework that allows you to just easily package up and develop uh, uh, with your application. So it packages it up for you. It runs like iOS simulators or Android simulators and um, or even web uh, simulators. And then you can use Expo to actually package up your app so you can publish it to the Play Store or whatever you want to do with it. So that is just the tech stack. Um, so this is the architecture. It's, it's a pretty simple architecture. Uh, so we just have a user interacting with the app. Um, and then the app just interacts with one API, uh, which is this recipe cookbook API that's actually being hosted in Azure. And then this API just communicates with a Redis cache and a database. And these are both also in Azure. So I have slides for each of these components. So we're going to get to see kind of like what, why use these components? Like what, what does, what do they even look like? And um, we'll kind of dive more into depth. All right. So now I can kind of show the little simple app that I built. Uh, let me see. Um, I think it's behind. Okay, cool. <laughs> so let me see. I don't, think I can enlarge. Let me actually see if, what happens if I do that. Oh, okay, cool. Can you guys still see the, the app? Yep. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So this is my uh, little recipe app. Uh, it's just a very simple crowd app. And another disclaimer, I'm not a UI engineer. I'm not a front end engineer. So I did the best I could. <laughs> and I, to me, it looks all right. But um, yeah, I, I definitely focus more on the back end. But yeah, so we have these lists of recipes. Um, so let me just click on this key lime pie. Um, and so we can see we have these list of ingredients and these instructions and a little summary and the date. And usually for the ingredients, we have like the amount for each of these, um, whatever you're using in your recipe. And I see that like, oh, I have one lime for my key lime pie. And I'm kind of like, huh, I think I need more. Uh, I think I need three limes for this recipe. So I click on that. Actually, let me go back and do that again. So we have two these two buttons at the top right corner. Um, and I'm like, OK, this pencil probably means edit. So I click on it. And it leads me to this form. And so this form is already populated uh, with, obviously, what your recipe is. And it, it's allowing you to edit. So um, immediately, when you first look at it, you're like, what are, what are all these pluses and Xs? Uh, it, does, it is kind of confusing at first. So um, these ingredients and instructions are list, right? Uh, you usually have more than one. And so you, I needed a way to just be able to add and delete really easily. Um, and so this is kind of these little buttons help you do that. So if I click on this little plus, uh, another ingredient row just kind of shows up and I can add another ingredient there. And if I want to get rid of it, I just click the X. And so um, I kind of wanted it to just exist at every single step just because like I could want especially for instructions, you could just want to like have um, like, let's say you forgot a step, then you want to click this here so that, yeah. And then, so, okay, let me go back here. So for the limes, I said I wanted to change it to three. So I just go ahead and do that. And I'm going to click the submit button. It says recipe saved. Nice. <laughs> I'm going to go back home. And then I'm going to click back on here and we can see, all right, cool. The limes updated to three. Uh, very simple. And then I'm just going to click on this one now. And I'm like, oh, it says delete, delete me. So I'm like, okay, I probably want to delete that. And then we have this trash can here. Um, so that probably going to be deleting. And it says, are you sure you want to delete this recipe? Um, sometimes you accidentally click on things. So I just put that never mind there just in case. And then it just exits out. Uh, but I do want to delete it. So let me click delete. And then it says home. And then we can see that it's gone. Um, and just a quick note, um, React Native, when you navigate between screens, it doesn't automatically reload those screens for you. So I actually have listeners um, at each of those screens that basically listens to if I navigated back if from a create or a delete um, or an update. And so it reloads the page so that you can see the changes you just made. Um, so if I didn't do that, then this would like, I would have to like refresh the whole app for these changes to show up. So that's just a quick note on, on kind of things you need to uh, look out for when you're working in React. All right, so the last piece of our CRUD 
uh, operation is just creating one. So we can say, let's say Nova Engineering Group. Yay. And then the cool group. And then we see these red that show up. So um, I put, I just put a simple form validation in here um, just to have at least one ingredient and at least one instruction. Uh, so you can't put, you can't submit unless you have uh, added something here. So let me just type something random. Let me just type something random here. So that went away, but this doesn't go away because this is actually one object. So the ingredient class consists of both the actual ingredient name and the amount. So you need to fill out both um, for that to work. And then go home. Yay, that recipe we just created is there. Cool. Um, but yeah, that is basically all I have uh, for this very simple app. Um, so let me just go back to the presentation. Uh, let me do that. Okay, cool. Okay. So, um, actually, sorry. Okay, cool. So now I just wanted to talk about the very basics of React Native. I'm not going to go too into depth here because there's a lot of nice docs that will explain it better than I can. Um, but in React, you deal with function and class components. So a component is basically just allows you to modularize your code. You can think of it as just like an object that you're going to work with within your code. So for example, in that list of recipes that we saw, one of the rows, like so we saw a list of rows, right? And you can click on each of the recipes. Each of the rows is a recipe item function. So um, and then the recipe list, like that main page you saw as a whole is its own component. It's its own function component. So it's kind of like, you can think of it as like Lego building blocks. It's like, I have these, a bunch of these recipe item components within this large like home page component. So that's kind of um, the building blocks of uh, what you work with in React Native. So this is great because it really allows you to like modularize and keep everything really neat and clean. Um, and reuse things very easily. And now we have a uh, React Native UI components. So um, this, these are just things that come straight out of the box with React Native. Um, core components are just those UI components like buttons, form controls, activity indicators. And React Native has, uh, has all of these and they actually all map to a kind of a different component in iOS and Android. And so um, that's kind of gives you a sneak peek into how React Native really works in the back end is just like it has these mappings for each of these like corresponding um, like UI components for the React Native version, there's the iOS version, there's the Android version. Um, so that, that's how it, it's able to basically um, render for both uh, platforms. And then we have something called a prop and props is actually just short for properties. So these are arguments that you can configure um, and you pass in to each of your components to let you customize your, your components. So for example, um, each recipe item that I just discussed, which was a component, um, it takes in the name and the date and the recipe. So um, as we clicked on it, the recipe is used to navigate to the actual recipe page. And then we, we were able to see the name and the date of the recipe when we first loaded that homepage. Um, so those were all done by props. And then lastly, we have state. So state is basically like a components data storage. So it's useful for, useful for handling data that changes over time or comes from user interaction. So it gives your components memory. So for example, a really simple way I'm using it is showing and hiding those modals. So I'm keeping uh, track of um, if a user has clicked submit or if they've um, tried to delete and switching, I'm like toggling on and off, uh, showing the modals or hiding the modals. So that's just a very simple example. Um, and now we're just, that was all for the front end and now we're just gonna get into the backend services I use. So um, that, uh, so I have an API that we saw in that architecture diagram. And this is actually deployed to an Azure app service. Um, so this is a managed service for building and deploying apps and APIs into the cloud. Uh, it supports all these different languages that we see here. And I was just using Java. Um, after I left Microsoft, I don't really use .NET or .NET Core anymore. Uh, but for those of you who really love that language, um, almost all Microsoft products support it. So um, that's great. 
And it's really easy to maintain CI/CD. So if you're just like developing um, like from your laptop or something, and I want to deploy to prod, I literally run one command on the command line. Obviously, that's not what you want to do in a real production environment, production setup. Um, for a development environment, it's great. And then for production cases, you can just set up a whole CI/CD pipeline from GitHub or Azure DevOps. Uh, I think Microsoft supports a bunch of um, different providers you might be using to handle your CI/CD. So um, you can do that. And let me actually switch over to the Azure portal. So this is what the Azure portal looks like if um, you have not seen it before. So it's basically um, just a UI kind of that allows you to interact with all your cloud resources. And it's really cool because right away, you can just kind of see these like random metrics that they populate. Um, and I didn't have to do anything to set them up. These are just like out of the box. And of course you can set uh, more in-depth metrics. Um, but we see like the data in, the data out, we see the number of requests, we see the response time or average response time. So this obviously helps um, when you're dealing with like the production of uh, app. Um, and then you can also very easily uh, authenticate. So there's this like a whole authentication section here on the left hand side that you can click on to use to uh, set that up. And you can also um, very easily uh, scale up or scale down your app. So let me actually click on here. So you can see if you want to scale out your app service, like with the number of instances, you can just drag this thing here. Um, and then you can also scale up and just choose a different tier, like a different plan um, that uh, supports um, higher loads. Because this obviously this app doesn't handle that much traffic. Um, or it doesn't need to. But yeah, that is the app service. Okay, and then now I have a database, which was also in that architecture diagram. And the database that I'm using is actually um, Azure Cosmos database, which is a NoSQL database. And um, it's really easy to set up and use um, it has a bunch of APIs that are supported like MongoDB, SQL, Cassandra. So whichever one you're comfortable with, I use SQL. Um, and the great thing about having a managed database is uh, it has all these things that come with it, like low response times, SLA backed availability, like they, Microsoft or Amazon or whatever provider you're using makes all these promises to you um, of how available uh, your data is gonna be. And um, there's a lot of, there's multiple language support. So um, to actually set up like my API to talk to this database, it was literally just like, I think it was like importing a library and like changing a few things here and there, like a few lines of code and then adding like the key and the actual database URL into like my properties file. Not like that was it. So super simple to get started. Oh, actually I wanted to show the database. So this is the database account that I have. Um, so I'm going to go straight to the data explorer. So this shows me exactly what's in my database. So um, I see we have two collections, a recipe collection and a user collection. And in the recipe collection, um, I just click on it and I can literally just see the data that's in here. I can query, like you can write SQL queries right here. Um, and I've done that before, so that's really useful too. And um, you see this user ID right here. So you choose a partitioning key for each of your data uh, tables. So I chose user ID because it just makes sense to partition on the user because for one user, they're always gonna be pulling in like their recipes, right? So um, that's how the data is divided and it makes uh, it um, very efficient. Um, and then let me click on the scaling right here. So you can also scale uh, really easily. You can scale database really easily, as easily as you can your app service. Um, so you can do auto scale or manual depending on what you need. So for instance, if your API is getting hit all of a sudden with so many requests, um, if you just set up auto scale, Azure will scale it for you. So you don't have to worry about it and be monitoring it constantly. Um, so that's like, those are nice little perks that come with just using a managed service. All right. And the last uh, thing I used was the Redis cache uh, or the Azure Redis cache service. Um, and a cache is obviously very useful because um, you can just 
the scale and a lower cost and it's it's just less expensive to hit a cache and um, expanding database instances is pretty expensive. So um, that's why most people use caches. And this is actually just Redis cache, but hosted on Azure. So it supports all the Redis data structures. Um, it's obviously distributed, et cetera. It's just kind of like has a little Azure wrapper around it. Um, and I just basically used it uh, to store like the recipe ID and the recipe. So um, in the recipe case, most people don't update their recipes as often as they might other uh, objects and or, or other CRUD uh, situations. Um, Cause once you have a good recipe, you just keep it. And so there's a lot more fetch. There's a lot more uh, get requests in general for my uh, use case. So um, that's why a cache will be really useful because you know, I can just keep it in there and it'll hit the cache um, with, instead of having to make a trip to the database. Um, so I did that. And then I also cached the user ID to a list of recipe IDs. Um, so that's the same scenario because one user is gonna be logged in and they wanna just grab all the recipes that they have. Um, so it, it's great to have that cached. And honestly, there were some difficulties uh, integrating with Java API. I, I don't work for Microsoft Azure, so I don't have to be like, super like, oh, it's the best thing ever. Um, because they, I, there was a lot of serialization issues uh, because I was actually working with two different formats of writing to the cache. So I was writing a recipe object as well as like a list uh, or a serialized string of like a list of recipe objects. And so you had to set up all this like serialization mapper stuff um, that doesn't really, is not explained really in the docs anywhere. And I was also having to deal two different, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Redis, you need to have these like templates that interact with the cache. And so I needed to have two different ones because I have two different formats um, that I'm writing to and reading from the cache. And so that was kind of uh, not the most fun experience and hopefully Microsoft will have better samples or they can just use my uh, code if they want. But yeah, so that that was all uh, set up. Um, yeah, and then the, uh, um, I guess we're talking about the to-do features now, which is kind of like, I, I, this app is not really finished in my head, but I realized no piece of software is actually ever really finished. Um, it's always evolving. And so these are some things that I wanna add uh, later on. So I wanna definitely set up authentication for the API. So I want the React Native app to always have to um, be, authenticated in order to make calls to this API. And we saw in that Azure portal that that's actually really, really simple. Um, there's just like a document you have to follow, like a bunch of steps, and then you set that up and um, should be good to go. And then I want to set up user accounts and a login authorization flow. Um, so as we saw, there was no logging in or anything. Um, so that's a, that's a big part of an app and a very necessary part. So I want to set that up and manage different user accounts. I'm debating on what to use for this. Um, there is Azure, I think there's things in Azure you can use. There's like Azure data providers. Um, and then there's like usually mobile apps, you have like the sign in with Facebook, sign in with Microsoft account, et cetera. So you can integrate and use each of those um, different APIs. So I'm, I probably go, we'll have to do that. I wanna add search and filtering on that main recipe screen that we saw. Uh, I, you know, if you have 20 recipes and you're scrolling, that's really not a great experience. So just being able to search or filter would be really nice. And then lastly, just supporting the uploading of images because in recipes, they usually have images to show like, hey, this is what it's gonna look like at the end. And it's a, it's a really important part. So I want to uh, support that. Probably we'll use like another Azure service. Like there's Azure blob storage you can use to uh, sup, uh, store those kinds of uh, binary files. So. Yeah, that is probably what I'm gonna do. And actually that is the end of my presentation. I actually went a, a lot uh, faster than I expected. Um, but yeah, that is, that's all, that's all. Thank you. And uh, I can stop sharing. Is, is that okay, Gene? Should I stop sharing? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right, well, thank you for that. Um, so Arvin, you were the first one to ask about, uh, react native. Uh, did you have any questions? 
Uh, I actually do have a question about, you did mention something about the components have it to refresh. I'm not sure if that's exactly what you said, but you did say. Yep, that, that, yeah. that is what I said. Yeah, you're gonna have to like set that all up. Um, I, I forgot if React does that for you too. I'm not sure, but uh, React Native at least, um, you need to set up like listeners and have your own logic for that. Oh. So yeah, that's why I was like a bit confused because React does do it. And I thought just thought React Native would do it too. So when state changes, there's no like re-rendering? Um, no. Oh, wow. <laughs> or, well, it depends. Um, so for my case, if you're like hitting the back button to go to like the previous page or you're like changing, you're navigating pages, there's no re-rendering. Right. Or there's, okay. yeah. Okay. Hey, my name is Glenn. I have a question. Um, for Cosmos DB, uh, what's the pricing model like? Um, I am not a hundred percent sure. I actually, I can. I mean, I could look right now. I think it's just usually. Um, uh, like you want, I, I don't know if I can actually give you like the actual price, <laughs> uh, but I think it says. You can like, oh, actually there's like a capacity calculator you can use to say like, okay, these are the number of regions I want. Um, these are these are probably how many reads creates updates per second I will have and it'll tell you like a price. Yeah, I think when I you can, have it, when it. you had it on the screen, I think it was, everything was done in RU per S, so read updates per second. Yeah. Right, okay. Cool. All right. Um, anyone else, Tom, do you have any questions? Uh, I don't, thank you. It was a good overview of the application and what's available. Yeah, I agree. It was a neat way to see how the, um, how all the pieces go together, you know, uh, that, that you're, you're using a lot of services from that the cloud's providing, not setting up your own Redis, not setting up your own, you know, database and all of that. Um, like I said, I do a lot of DevSecOps and in the government space, one of the things we fight with quite often is they want to use the cloud, but they really want to use it only as a data center. Um, so yeah. they're, they're not confident really using some of the hosted services like those. Uh, and it's, it's nice to see how easy it is to, to just, you know, put those things together and not have to worry about managing them. Yeah, actually, Microsoft Azure government and there's like Microsoft Secret. It's like it has like all these clearances, uh, and like they like basically block off your data so no one else can access it. It's like they keep all your data separate in like a separate like partition or something. Um, so yeah, that that's an option for government uh, agencies. But I think in general, government is just slower to move to the cloud because it's scary to yes. have all your stuff out, out there. They, sure, they that's, have, that's one reason. <laughs> they, have, <laughs> they have processes that uh, that say, here's how we set the, you know, let's let's say it's a, you know, a database. Here, here's how we set a database up. And they don't really trust anybody else to set that up for them, even if it means doing a lot more work for them. So don't assume that it's just the government that feels that way. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Yes. So it's true. I apologize. I missed an early part of the uh, presentation, but uh, you are stringing together quite a few managed services. Are you using any sort of a templating language to keep them in order so that you could reproduce it in like say another account or something? You know, like you could have partitioned your dev and your test. Is there a, a templating language you're using to set all that up? I didn't just because I knew I only needed uh, one or two <laughs> things, um, but there's ARM templates, which are Azure resource templates, uh, oh, which, <laughs> yeah, which you're very familiar with, which <laughs> is very easy to, uh, actually, I don't know if it's that easy to use, but that is easy that once you have it, you can just keep recreating the same resources with the same configurations. Um, but yeah, I think that's YAML file, I think. Uh, but yeah, I, I haven't been using that. <laughs> Now, I was curious because some people use the native cloud provider templating language. Other people go off and use Terraform, and usually there's somebody finds some efficiency in one over the other. So I was curious what your experience was, but that's cool. Thank you.
All right. Well, uh, let me go ahead. I'm going to stop the recording. No one else has questions.